ladies and gentlemen. The next thing, and you get feedback to the performance. Today we learned a little bit about Star Partners and got a little insight about how to build a company and some experience in sports. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leonardo stage this afternoon. Our first speaker is the founder of GiveMeSport.com, and he's going to be talking about disruption in sport. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Fain. Woo! <laughs> so I could probably um, walk in the middle if you can't hear me, but. Disruption in sport, what do I really mean by that? Um, looking back in our kind of more modern history, whether it's music, software, or also looking back at um, movies, all of these industries have been disrupted. So where I say disruption, I mean the status quo has changed. About 10 years ago, or 19, uh, so right, you feel right, get onto that. So I really think is that what well, I'm trying to pose the question here is the bubble about to burst or close to bursting on the sports rights industry something that I'm becoming much more closer to myself where people are paying for access to rights Where did it start 1999 Napster set themselves up Sean Parker was the uh, CEO and founder of Napster who then went on to be played by Justin Timberlake in the Social Network movie. So, Sean himself had a career that's been pretty incredible. But he started the disruption in music and it was all about changing the status quo, allowing music fans to share music tracks from peer to peer. Um, the music industry didn't like this. They tried, sorry, sorry, it's very difficult to hear. They tried to um, stop this. They tried suing the customers, they tried working with the ISPs, they tried, they tried everything possible to, to stop this. But it still continued. This was like a, an epidemic that took hold. It culminated in uh, iTunes, of which now we kind of take for granted, where iTunes get a very, very uh, large split of the royalty from the artist. That then filters down so there is less money available for the music labels to pay their staff. So they essentially get more interns, free staff. And ultimately, it's the artist that suffers. Um, this happened again with software. Don't know if any of you here remember Kazar. So Kazar, again, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Very similar kind of theme here, where you could go and get a cracked copy of anything at the time, Windows, Photoshop, whatever you wanted. You could go onto Kazar, you could download it. The founder of that was Nicholas Zenstrom. What he went to do after that was Skype. So you've got two guys that have innovated and disrupted in their respective, I, mean, I call it vertical, music and then software. They've gone on to build and be part of two of the biggest leading in the company, uh, sorry, companies on the entire planet, Skype and Facebook. Pirate Bay, this is a more modern example of what's happening where you have something called a torrent. So I don't, my audience here is fairly small. Has any, can everyone raise a, raise a hand out of 20 people? Anyone here been on Pirate Bay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Any behind the camera? No, seven, seven out of 12. So that's a pretty high ratio of torrents. Um, this is what the movie industry is uh, exceptionally worried about. They're shutting this down left, right, and center. They've, the guys that founded the Pirate Bay have been in court in Sweden. Uh, they've lost. They lost in the court in Sweden, and um, essentially they've been asked to shut down Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay would argue that they're just a tool that enables people to um, download software. It's the person who downloads the software of the movie that is um, committing the the sin in their case. But is this happening in sport? So, sport is one of the wealthiest industries out there. Think about the World Cup, think about the Champions League. More recently, think about the, uh, the money that was paid for Gareth Bale, over 100 million euros for one player. It wasn't too long ago that Alan Shearer went for 15 million, and that was a world transfer. It's the amount of money that is in sport. For me, it's, and the amount of passion that is in sport. Go back to music, if you think about music, people tend to be passionate about a genre of music, and they like artists. 
they're not necessarily going to stab someone if you don't like uh, the blaze, the uh, so solid crew. Well, that, that might happen, but if you go, <laughs> if you don't, if you like Elton John or Lana Ritchie, then um, you're not going to really get in a fight. But in sport, think about the passion that's behind sport. It's the mo one of the most important things in the papers every single day. Sporting stars write the agenda. It's what everyone's talking about up and down the country, across Europe. You can walk into any bar anywhere in the world if you know enough about sport and strike up a conversation. It's very difficult to do that in politics or religion because you will then get into a fight. So for me, it's just natural that sport is a very wealthy vertical area. Um, lots of money sloshing around. It's very passionate. Fans love it. And from where I'm seeing, wherever I'm sitting, I'm seeing that the disruption is happening. It's just starting, and things are very much starting to change. So what do I mean by what is happening? I don't know if any of you have heard of My Peer to Peer. Has anyone a little array of hands of anyone? My Peer to Peer, anyone used it? One, two, three, four. So 40% of our audience have used it. Um, this is where, for the ones who haven't used it, you can stream every single sports match in the world, not in high definition, but in good enough definition, definitely for your iPad, completely for free. So um, I might, actually, I probably am on camera here. I probably shouldn't say anything. I, um, <laughs> in July, July the 13th, this company, also known as First Row Sports, had uh, lost a legal battle. So the British courts, the Premier League essentially won a landmark case that is, in their eyes, going to stop the sports fan logging on to mypeer-to-peer. -to -peer it was .eu last week. It'll be .it next week. It'll be dot, it's, like an, it's like a virus that these com companies, like the Premier League, are not understanding how to deal with. Instead of looking historically at how to deal with music, how to deal with movies, where they've had to be innovative, and think around a problem, as opposed to just saying, this is how it's always been. I want my 39 pounds a month for my Sky Sports package. The big incumbents are now being forced, because what's going to happen with my peer-to-peer -peer is it's like whack-a-mole. You shut down one website, it'll open up in a country where there is no copyright or there is no jurisdiction. Uh, the likes of Russia, China, very interesting com uh, countries when it comes to particularly copyright laws. Um, Russia particularly, you can have your servers in uh, old army barracks where the Russian laws don't even apply. If you want to find a way to hide your software, hide your, ser hide your content, you, you will find a, find a way. And by chopping down one my peer-to-peer, -peer, it gets people like me talking about it. There will be thousands of people talking about it. That will inspire other people to create hundreds more of these things. So they're just going to amplify their problem and they haven't solved the solution because really what's happening is the young audience is gravitating to these free sharing sites. They've grown up with this. My generation is very different. I'm 33, I say that's my generation. 18 to 24, it's the norm to go home and not pay your Sky Sports subscription to, and to put my, my uh, free sport or my peer-to-peer -peer on and just watch it. You don't think anything about it. So what I guess I predict the next reaction, my peer to peer shut down. What happened in 2008? What did the music industry do? Their first reaction was to sue their customers. So they had a class action. They were trying to find out who the individual people that were illegally downloading music and then take them to court. They had two or three people. Well, I don't know what school of business they went to, but in my school of business, you don't sue your customers. You try and work with them and you try and work and find out their needs and give them what they want. I see this happening in sport today. They're suing the my peer to peer. They'll start them by trying to sue the fan who's at home, who's 18 years old, you know, probably very nervous, probably got lots of spots, probably you know, loves Manchester United, and they're going to sue him and take him to court. It, and that will just get worse and worse and worse. And what I hope they do is learn from the mistakes of the past and then, you know, Learn how to love your customer. Pretty key message. Don't file lawsuits. All that's going to do is cost them money, and what is it going to achieve? Absolutely nothing. 
and really work with the customer. But where does this put someone like a Sky? So Sky is obviously the, it's the biggest um, broadcaster in the UK. They've got a Sky, Sky Sports, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. They've now released a product called Now TV. So Sky are competing with themselves as a pay-as-you-go product. In America, the innovations already happened with Netflix, um, Hulu, quite a few, Rock, Rock U. These are all pay-per-view TV channels where you just pick what you want. You either want to watch Mad Men, House of Cards, and you pay as you go. Well, why can't this happen in sport? Well, it can happen in sport. Um, what News Now have done, sorry, what Sky Sports have done with Now TV is enabled you to get a box, a little white box, you plug into your TV, and you can pay as you go for the sport matches you want. This is something I've done with my friends. I think it's pretty cool, because I pay for the game, the other guys pay for the beer. It works out pretty nicely. It's about $8.99 for a, for a day pass. But even that, $8.99 sounds like a lot of money. That's, that's like a month of subscription of all the music in the world on Spotify. So I can't see that. That's also not being very innovative. All that Sky have done there is they've looked to America and they've copied what's going on in America. Why don't they rethink the strategy and go, what can we do different here? How can we keep content free? Just to put it in context, Sky and BT Sport paid the Premier League three billion pounds this, for this season for the rights to broadcast a certain number of games on TV. Three billion, that is an incredible amount of money. That's also 70% more than last year, 7-0. So getting close to, get, I wouldn't be surprised with that. So that is a fantastic job for the Premier League. Well done for them doing that. Sky see this as key in their what their kind of marketing play. And this is, again, nothing new. I don't know if many of you have heard of Ted Turner. So Ted Turner was one of the innovators in the States of the cable network. So what Ted did all these years ago, Sky have been doing for donkey's years, and they, they have a broadband service. They then pay whatever money it takes for the sports rights. They link the two together to make it exclusive. And really what they want is for you to take their broadband and buy the other, the other, the other packages. This model is broken. It's not working. It's not working in America. Um, it's not working. Over. This is an old model where you can be making so much more of the internet by having free content, not having essentially a paywall. Something that shocked me was to see a paywall for the sun. A paywall for the sun that it's widely known that the sun's target audience is the white van driver, white van man driver, and which demographic do you not want to ask for more money from? The guy in his white van. You don't want to ask him for a pound a week when they're going to share one son between five of them, and that's 20p. So this is where I just think the powers that be, particularly in the sport industry, are just getting it wrong. Putting up paywalls, the sun's traffic has nosedived. Saying that, the Wall Street Journal has, the Wall Street Journal where I think if you are a publication where you have financial information, like the Financial Times, it's information that you can't get elsewhere, then paywalls can work in that case. But in sport, where you're reading opinion pieces, you're reading um, news, features, breaking news, you can get that from everywhere in the world. And for me, one of the best places is the BBC. They're never going to have a paywall. Well, they kind of do with the uh, TV license anyway. But paywalls aren't the answer. And really what Sky's done is put a paywall up on their sports content. It's all they've done. Cost you £39 to enter their, their kind of domain. You get to watch their sports content, but you can actually watch it for free on your laptop anyway. So it's not, it's not a great decision-making process. Should I sign up for hundreds of pounds or should I watch it for free? This is what I think should happen. And this is a bit more radical. Um, I think that all sports, particularly the Premier League, should go free to air. When I've spoken to sports rights holders and owners, for them, the important thing is, yes, money. And really, the, the subscription is about the money, locking you in, owning the audience. There is so much innovation, and I'll kind of talk about some of this, on digital advertising at the moment, making money from websites, making money from the internet, happening right now. It's probably the fastest growth curve of innovation in digital advertising that I've ever experienced. What that means for me as a, someone who owns a website is I get more money for the same number of people. So there are lots of very smart people, advertisers, brands that are working out how to target just the right people that they want to reach on my website. And they want to pay more for that. And it's easier for them to contact me. It's become this, this whole era of digital advertising is booming. 
you've got companies that are three or four years old that are going to be floating for two billion euros next month, and all they are is a middleman between the digital advertising partners. Billions of pounds for these companies. And what I call the incumbents, the kind of skies of this world, and the foxes over in the States, and the star sports over in Asia, they're fixated on an old model because it's what they've always done. For them, when they have a board meeting, they're looking at their, pro they're looking at their numbers and going, this is a risk. They've got young companies like myself that don't have all that legacy, and we're taking all these risks, and some of them are paying off. To give you a small example of this, um, a year ago, I was offered the uh, goal highlights for the Premier League clips, the ones that, you, um, that most fans get for free on YouTube. I didn't buy them, ESPN bought them. It became the ESPN Goals app. This has now gone on to become the, the sum where you watch your goal highlights. Five million pounds, that was the price for those. Five million pounds for something that a fan can get quicker within five minutes on YouTube. But they have to wait, 12, I think it was till midnight that day. So if the, the match is finishing around six o'clock, you've got to wait six hours. Time has passed by then, you've watched match of the day. Why would I want to pay for it? And this is the mindset of the people that um, are out there selling rights. Luckily for me, there are some companies out there that are showing some real thought leadership innovation. One of these companies is IMG, one of the larger sports rights management companies in the world. They're also, they also realized that they didn't know everything about social media, so they started working with my company as well. What they have done is enable us to have some key, really cool sports rights. So if you're going to give me sport, you can watch live Belgium football games. So where Fellaini, Lukaku, all the teams that they came from, you can watch them in high definition on our website for free, completely for free. We don't even have any adverts on those. You can watch the Argentinian Football League every single game for free. You can watch all of, the, all of these leagues you can watch for free on our website. You can watch the uh, NRL for all the Aussies that are living in London. I've got every single NRL game live, free to air on our website with, no, with not a rubbish experience, just a full screen player, all for free. And this is where IMG leading this space have woken up to the fact that they have to think a little bit differently. And how are they going to make money? And how can they make more money than they made historically? And this is around advertising and digital advertising, particularly in video. So when I talked about the innovation, this is one of the main areas in digital advertising. The reason for the innovation is all the money in advertising on TV, and the TV guys are waking up that young sports fans are on their iPad watching sports games, they're on their iPhone watching sports games. Maybe it's their laptop that's even plugged in to stream the sports game through Sky Go or another product. They're understanding this, and their budget is coming over to digital. This is a key point in our history in the kind of online sport industry that more money is coming in. Rights holders are waking up to the fact that they want more people watching their event than less. They want more people watching it because then more turn up. More will then buy a ticket, which is really where they make their money. And then sponsors will pay more. Whether it's a golf event on TV, like the Open, where the Open is one of the um, events that the BBC broadcasts. They get some amazing sponsorship deals. They're fantastic in the event. The more events that are like that, that's free to wear, the better in my case. And the more rights that can be passed from the likes of a rugby league or a European football league, you can make more money from advertising. You just have to be smarter about it. And you have to be up with all the current trends and know what's happening. That's one of the, the key kind of messages. So interesting, this deal happened, I think, yesterday. So very topical. YouTube has done a deal with the Football League. So as of, I think, this season now, Football League is putting all its goal clips, all its highlights, essentially like match of the day, on very quickly after the games for all of the Football Leagues. Championship, League One, League Two. I think this is the beginning of what is going to happen with these rights holders waking up. So five year, four years ago, you would have had a commercial guy at the Football League trying to sell the rights to the Football League, their digital rights, to a range of companies. Normally, at that point, it would have been Yahoo, AOL, MSN, and wanting millions for it. And if they didn't get those millions, then they have to rethink. Now, this is a great idea. They've, they've partnered up with one of the biggest platforms in the world where people are actually, where the eyeballs are, where people are watching video. You don't have to drag people from another platform to YouTube, they're already on there, and they've got some really premium content. Uh, I don't know if any of you are into surfing or extreme sports. Um, I quite like them, but last, uh, last month, you had some big surfing events, all free to air, on live stream as well. So this kind of disruption that I started with 
it's not, is it going to happen? It already is happening. It's just whether you know about it or not. And if you don't know about it, then you're going to be left behind the curve. If you're worrying about subscriptions, how do I tie a customer down, not letting them to move you know, freely between products, that's not the way that we've learned from music, movies, and software to deal with this. The way to deal with it is much more in this line. So do a deal, big distribution partner. I mean, the way I look at YouTube, it's just, a, it's just eyeballs. It's just a way to reach people. Um, and a very, very effective way. The big elephant in the room in this case is something that I sometimes talk quite a lot about and elaborate more. It's on the social media side. So I don't know how much of you know what um, me and my business partner achieved at Sports New Media, but we started four years ago with a dream to connect the fan and the athlete, bring them closer together. And my business partner is the kind of Jerry Maguire of the two of us. He handles all the sports stars, the agents, um, does a fantastic job doing that. And we started with Wayne Rooney and Rio Ferdinand. With what we wanted to do was help Wayne Rooney and Rio Ferdinand make the most of social media, help them build their audience and do it the way that we thought was right. And then that snowballed through um, word of mouth. Athletes were telling athletes that what a good job we'd done. We now sit here today, we've got 200 athletes from football, cricket. We pretty much have the entire cricket team for the Ashes. We're doing the post. We have most of Team GB. Over the Olympics, if all of our, all of our athletes that we represented, if we added up all their medals, uh, my company would have finished 12th in the league table of, the, of all the countries. Tom Daly is one of our best clients. These are clients that get the start with the audience first, particularly in sport. Get, your, get that link between you as the athlete or the content owner and the audience and then work out what they want to watch or what they want to hear from you and then give them that. Instead of actually presuming that you know that someone wants to watch uh, an Aston Villa game because he's a Tottenham fan, it probably won't happen. Um, but the elephant in the room here, so what people aren't worrying about is Facebook. So Facebook is the number one biggest way to reach, and easiest way to reach people in the world. Facebook have created this ecosystem where for free, if you've got good enough compelling content, you can push your message onto Facebook, and it can be via celebrity in my case, and people will watch it, engage with it, share it. Now, Facebook IPO'd, and one of the things when, I guess in my experience with the IPO that didn't go very well, um, is that you have to start making more money. You have to find new ways to make money. And if most people start, if you think about yourself, you wake up, well, excuse me as an example, wake up, check my iPhone, did I do anything stupid last night? No? Okay, good. I'm looking at my news feed, seeing what I did, uh, I'm checking Facebook first. And this is a complete opposite to something like ITV. So I, my advice is, why not go onto the platform that someone's already using instead of, with ITV's case, they want you to download their, their app, which is five steps and very few people do it. So if you work and leverage Facebook properly, we've shown that you can build something pretty incredible. So those 200 athletes, um, you add up all the, the followers on those pages. Plus, we also do all the social media work globally uh, for FIFA and for UEFA, particularly on Facebook, so are those two. So FIFA and UEFA, two of the biggest rights holders on the planet, and all those athletes. That gives us 150 million sports fans that we've collected an audience for. We've then looked at the data, looked at what they do like, what they don't like. We've got seven billion rows of data on these sports fans. And really what that shows us is, is what we most of us really know, but they want to know about Ronaldo, Gareth Bale, Messi. They don't want to know about the lesser known players. So that's, a harder, that's, that's an issue for the players to deal with. So once you know that, and you know how to leverage Facebook, why, why can't you use that information to distribute sports rights? So if you're a rights owner, why can't you take that content, put it onto Facebook, it's just another way for people to watch it. It's an easier way. They're already on their iPhone. You can just click play and it will launch a live stream if you want to. Why do I have to take them somewhere else? So this is an interesting dynamic on Facebook with um, clubs versus players. The perceived wisdom is it should, that Real Madrid is more popular, or one of the most popular clubs in the world. Man Manchester United, Real Madrid, Barcelona would all argue that they are the most popular. My team Spurs, unfortunately, has got slightly less popular, and Real Madrid have got much more popular in the last week. But the really interesting dynamic here, and I'm 
saying this to link in with really, a, this is a way for Real Madrid to reach an audience, and they have sports rights as well, so clips of their games. Ronaldo's 50% bigger, his audience is 50% bigger than the entire team put together. That shouldn't be the case. <laughs> it, just should, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the case that one guy is 50% more popular than a club. And if you look at one of the key numbers on any, any page on Facebook is the people talking about. If you look at that percentage, it gives you an idea of how interesting the content is they're posting. That's one of the key things to look at. So if you're talking about numbers pretty low, and when I say low, that's less than 1%, that is, means you need to do something about it. If it's between 2 and 5%, that's OK. So the NFL or one of our clients, UEFA, might be getting up to 9%, which is kind of best in the world for a sports event of people engaging with it. But over the Olympics, for Tom Daly and Jessica Ennis, their numbers were off the chart. They were 80%, 90% engagement because we helped the athletes understand what to post, when to post. And the key really with, that, with, with athletes is people are really passionate about athletes. They're watching a live sports game, probably on my peer-to-peer, -peer, for free, streaming it. <laughs> and, um, and they want to hear from the athlete. Uh, so when Jess won gold, remember that? Well, it was Jess and Mo, it was amazing. Uh, that was, I was watching that on the BBC. Um, we were advising the athletes to post within a few minutes. So Jess and Tom Daly, before the Olympics, uh, had a few thousand fans. Afterwards, they were both over a million. To put that in perspective, we don't work with Mo Farrow. He finished the Olympics with 40,000 fans. So you've got two people who, I guess, listened to the advice and got that Facebook, if there's one takeaway from this that you do take, it's um, timing is everything, particularly when it comes to sport. You're watching that game, you're really passionate, goal goes in for Tottenham, scores, I'm going to go crazy, want to share that. Ten minutes later, when Arsenal have equalized, I'm not going to want to share that. So it's, it's understanding that there's using the passion in sport to drive your business. And if it's, in our case, we used it to drive the audience size um, to get to these 150 million sports fans. It's quite crazy when I say that, 150 million. Um, and then work out, yeah, reverse engineer it. So the, the normal logic would be build a website, then get some athletes to sign up, be ambassadors, and then spend some money marketing. Well, we didn't bother doing that. We worked with yeah, Rooney, Rio, Fellaini's another one of our clients. He's great. Um, and then we listen to what the young fans want. We write news about what the young fans want to read, and we're publishing it on the iPad, on smartphone. Uh, we haven't built an application. Everyone thinks I'm crazy. For me, Twitter and Facebook got pretty good applications. I'm not going to do a better one than that, so I just want to piggyback on them. And whoever the big network of the future is, I'll piggyback on that as well, because I'm only in relationship with the athlete. That's who the fan wants to get to. Not, I'm not trying to build the next Facebook. I'm leveraging them. And it works, that relationship. I give them access to Wayne Rooney, essentially content, pictures, selfies. Had some lovely pictures when he had a, his new baby was born. They were really cool. Um, and in turn, Facebook put that content in front of all these sports fans. It works very, very well. But we do drive clicks off. And what's been incredible is we set up this sports website that doesn't seem to be very well known with the, uh, my generation. But the 18 to 24-year-olds seem to know our website, Give Me Sport. So Give Me Sport has been, ali uh, been alive, been around six months. And in six months, we're the second biggest sports website in the country. We're bigger than Eurosport, bigger than AOL, we're bigger than Netflix, bigger than Love Film, bigger than ASOS, so the list goes on. The only dedicated sport website that is bigger than us at the moment is skysports.com. And the only non-dedicated sports website, so BBC Sport, which is a little bit of an unfair advantage they have on BBC Sport. But we're still, we're still hopefully, surpassed them. And we are seeing that in the next six months, we should be bigger than Sky Sports. And that's with 30 guys who work in Soho versus Sky Sports is hundreds of staff working near Heathrow with all their resource, all their power, all their might. And they haven't seen this coming, that we've started working with the fans, the athletes, because that's who the fan really wants to hear from. Understanding that there's a reason, sorry, there's a reason why Real Madrid is 40 million and Ronaldo is 60 million. It's because fans are more interested in him. So my business partner and I, and this is mainly led by my business partner, worked this out pretty early on. So we decided to go all in on athletes, realizing that disruption in sport is happening. 
we started working with uh, IMG, took investment from them, biggest sports rights manager in the world. IMG make all the Premier League clips, have lots of faith and trust with their clients. So they make all the Premier League highlights, chop them up. So, and then we've ultimately got this sports website that has something different, which is unique content. So hopefully we'll be getting a, a piece from Rooney's team about obviously the transfer window. But there's loads of interesting stories we can have. We've got uh, on a more London level, Yannick Balassi, if you're a Crystal Palace fan, he's writing a weekly uh, column on our blog on our website. Really, really interesting. What here, kind of how he's seeing Palace changing. Tom Daly's doing a blog, but he's traveling at the moment on a gap year. So all these athletes are seeing that if they write a story, um, on our website first, we push it out to social media, Facebook and Twitter and a few other ones, and it drives back to a destination website. Why can't that happen in sports rights? And this is where we are at the very kind of cutting edge of this and starting to give fans free access to fr free sport that's free either on their iPhone or their iPad. We don't really mind for us. It's just wherever they are, wherever they want to look at it, they can look at it. It's not a problem. And, um, and making it easy. So I don't think it's going to be too long before this is a reality. A lot of people talk about connected TVs, and I get, I get slightly bored with those conversations. For me, it's just a bigger screen, whether it's a small screen like my smartphone or the iPad mini or iPad or laptop. It's just a different size of a screen. That's it, really. So, and if Facebook have already got one billion people that they can push a message to, then it, Facebook don't mind if it's on a on a TV or on an iPad. It's just another way to connect. But the TV tends to be front and center in your home. It is bigger. So, expect this to happen. And obviously, when that does, where you normally watch your sports rights are on TV, hopefully the sports rights guys will wake up and go, "Wow!" Instead of there's an estimated, I believe it's four or five million people subscribe to Sky Sports, depending on which numbers you're looking at. Well, five million people on Sky Sports sounds like a pretty small amount when you're looking at the 40, 50, 60 million connected in the UK alone on Facebook. The one billion on Facebook. There are people all over the world that will want to watch um, the Premier League. We know this. I think in the future you'll also start seeing Ronaldo becoming his own TV channel. So when you get players that are of such kind of stature and so popular. Why wouldn't he? He's got 60 million. He's got more. That's two and a half times the X factor. If you're watching in the UK, and then look at the kind of sponsor that gets behind, behind that. And if he says, watch this, in fact, if Ronaldo says stand on one leg, I'd imagine most people will stand on one leg that are liking his page. He's so popular. And you've got Ronaldo, Messi, Beckham. You'll have Gareth Bale pretty soon. All of these are their own media channels, if they get it right and which Ronaldo definitely is. He's incredible with what he's doing. So if Ronaldo wants to own his own rights and then start monetizing them, what he needs is an audience, and he's now managed to build that very, very effectively. The same with our clients. It's the same with musicians. Um, this gets, this is very, uh, someone like Will Am is fantastic at this. He gets this, understands it. He's really got lots of thought leadership in the tech space. Getting musicians to promote their own tracks on their own page it's it sounds so simple, but this is what will ha continue to happen in sport and is, um, and is happening today. That is it. Any questions? Anyone brave? Hi. Um, do you feel you're selling sport or are you selling celebrity? Uh, both. We use the celebrity element to draw in the fan, but the fan, and then we publish sport content to them. So you kind of need both. We need the we need the celeb the draw of the celebrity to get the fans to connect with the page, and then they become inactive on the page if we don't have good content, whether that's video, pictures, or uh, text. So it, it is a it is definitely a bit of both on that. And it's combining them. It's, I guess for me, it's using the strengths of, of both. But if we had, let's say, the celebrity and then not very good content, we know that doesn't work. That, that's not a combination that works. You do have to have both. So we put a humongous amount of effort, focus on advising our clients on the right content to put on their pages. So to be clear, we don't post the content for them. We act as, on one side, uh, agency, strategy. 
So I would say to Tom Daly, here are the top three messages from all the other 200 athletes. Let's say it's one from David Beckham, could be one from Jay-Z in a different, different area, and one that he's done, and just show him what has worked. These guys are all pretty smart, and if you just say, look, here are three things that work well, they'll then go and do a, a picture or a selfie. They'll realize uh, with data, we'll say that if you post five minutes after an event, you get 1,000, uh, so, sorry, if you post uh, five minutes after an event, you get 10,000 more fans. If you post 15 minutes, you'll get 1,000. So it's a big, we, we teach them these kind of tips on uh, what to do with Facebook, how to do it. One of the, the key differences, so there are big differences between Facebook and Twitter, that people tend to lump, lump them in the same. Um, the difference I see with Facebook is it's a bit like, uh, a, that news feed is like a river of information. So information's going through it. And what you've got to do is you've got to know when to drop your content into, new, into Facebook, because people look at it in very different times. So very early on, 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning, so when people are just woken up, maybe they're on the toilet, checking their iPhone, it's one of our peak, peak viewing times. So if you're a traditional marketing team and you're at home brushing your teeth then, that's not going to work. So we developed a product that helped us uh, schedule messages to hit the kind of viewing times. That's... Huh? Automatically, yeah. So what we do is really, or someone real would maybe write it in advance, and they would just say, send. Send later. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. And then what we also do is um, that message, because let's say it goes out at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or maybe 7 p.m. in the UK, all of the sports fans living in Southeast Asia, it's a different time zone for them. So we take that same message and we republish it for a different global audience. So there's a lot of publishing, understanding that Facebook is little windows, like uh, prime time. You need to find what your prime time slot is. And that, for us, changes so regularly. It's so frustrating. Every two weeks, Facebook, a change in their algorithm. So what I, the advice I give in some of these talks, whether it's to post, uh, a pit, uh, have a message with a picture, at the moment, that is the best way to get the maximum number of people engaging, so commenting, liking, or clicking on your post. Two months ago, it used to be just text, no photo. So this is where our company does 600 tests a month, working out what works and what doesn't. And we share this information and make it public. So if any of you are interested in this information going forward on how to basically make the most of Facebook, how to grow your audience on Facebook quickly and for free, we don't encourage buying fans. This is where a lot of brands over the last two years have had a, it's basically who can pee out all the highest who's got the biggest fan page in the world, and a lot of them are just bought fans. And then when they go to send a message to them, it's normally a pretty stale brand message sent at the wrong time. It's fitting in around someone's nine to five schedule because they want to go to the pub later. And it's the smarter brands like Nike and Adidas that are really doing cool stuff around the Olympics and the events that are booming. Not the brands and the, uh, and the same with the athletes as well. Some of the older athletes we work with, because um, technology is not what they're used to. It's, uh, it's difficult for them to, to come and get their head around this. So they, they like to sit down in a press room, do have an interview. That's what they're used to. Someone like Tom Daly for us is exceptional. If ever, uh, he's so great to work with. Um, he's been brought up with technology. He's very comfortable with his iPhone or his Android, whatever, whatever he wants to use. He's great at taking pictures of himself. Normally, he's in his swimmers, so they do quite well by themselves with his female um, audience. They tend to share them. He's one of the most engaging athletes on the planet. He has, and his numbers speak for himself. So it's pretty incredible how popular Tom has become now in China. So, huh? Balotelli, I uh, haven't worked with him. I haven't worked with him. Uh, one of the nicest. Um, someone that I, uh, so Rio Ferdinand's probably, uh, someone he, he, I think he's fantastic as well. Rio's great, he gets it. He really, you know, Rio, the businessman as well as the footballer, he really gets and understands. Balotelli, I don't know. I haven't worked with him. Um, you've got lots of people, and, and Wayne Rooney, they're great to work with. What you, you know, they sometimes get a, a hard time in the press, but from my point of view, they're great to work with, and they get it, they take our advice, and that's the key thing with Facebook. This is my point I'm trying to, I guess, get across here, is the, um, that it changes. So what you know today doesn't mean it's going to work in a week's time. So if you can do a little test, do, do a little test. And it, the results can be staggering, like absolutely staggering, the difference. Where Facebook, when you go out to Palo Alto and you meet them, they are relatively young. 
as, a, as a, the guys working there, so they tend to chop and change their mind. That's one of the ways that they stay young and fresh and innovate all the time, and they will continue to do. But what this means is, if you have a business, I don't know if you remember the old Facebook where you had lots of tabs, you had a welcome tab, you always had tab, 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 tab for everything. One day Facebook just said, no, don't want this anymore, scrap them. I had a friend's business valued at $80 million overnight, gone. So it's just being able to kind of predict the chaos. Yeah. Predict uh, anyone else? <laughs> Go. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I, want, I was just curious. So, yeah. a celebrity uh, sportsman uh, becomes your client. Yeah. And obviously pays you good money to uh, devise a strategy to get his popularity up in, in social yeah. media. And you do so, and you know, obviously you understand that fantastically well. Uh, what, what, do they, what kind of uh, um, actions do they do? I mean, they obviously do this for a reason. Uh, athletes, they you know they mm -hmm. want 40 million or 60 million uh, 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 yeah. fo likes because whether it's through sponsorship or through endorsements or through different reasons they want to get in yeah. uh, other sources of income. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, a like an insight into what are those sources of income that athletes? Yeah. How do they monetize or cash in on this popularity? I mean, and do they and do? Yes, is, I can. And how clear is that for fans that is actually? Uh, that that is, there is a strategy as opposed to that there is a, um, uh, a, a, a false honest, advertising. Yeah, yeah honest. An honest. Yeah, honest. okay. So to break your question down, uh, the working with athletes just to answer you, we don't actually um, we do a revenue share on one side of it if there is a revenue that's made, but it's really for us. We provide a service that is worth anywhere up to fifty thousand pounds per year per client. We do that uh, for free, and the the quid pro quo is that the athletes give us content and access to them. That's really what we want is I want to give my young sports writer on Gimme Sport access to Wayne Rooney to write the exclusive. So we broke the exclusive about um, Rooney being included in the England squad even though he was injured. Was he injured? Wasn't he injured? Well, when I was at the England game, the first thing he did was sprint as fast as he could. So um, take what you want from that. But they're making the key point, second point there was about making money. So why do athletes, why does why does Ronaldo want a, a 60 million fans on his page? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. Sometimes it's uh, ego. You want to have a big fan page. You should have a big fan page. So if, if Messi, I remember about a year and a half ago, Lionel Messi didn't have a page on Facebook. We know the guys at Adidas pretty well. And, uh, and they sorted that out. And very quickly, he had, with Facebook's help, a very large page on Facebook. So that's the kind of, um, you should be there because you're of this, this stature. The um, sports sponsorship angle, this is a really interesting area. Uh, I think it's very interesting. That I think sports sponsorship is changing at the moment because when you do, let's say, UEFA do a big deal with Heineken, that deal is around 40 million euros per season, I think, for the Champions League. And what do Heineken get for that? They get their logo uh, with the uh, Champions League song and, and, you think, and then you buy Heineken. Well, and the way they generally quantify how good that spend is, is have we sold more beer? Quite hard to work that out. But then it's how many minutes have people viewed our logo flashing in the background? Well, the interesting angle for me is if it's done on minutes, I can also count the amount of minutes people look at a post on Facebook that has Heineken. So that's, that's, a, that's a way that you can't make money, but you can attribute value. So um, in Rooney's case, if there's a Nike post that goes up on his page, I can tell Nike how many fans have seen it, how long they've been looking at it, how you know, many engagements, how many, so it's a bit of a techie, te how many likes, comments, they all have a value. So that's where it attributes a media value, so it would be worth 50,000. The interesting um, argument is when we deal with a lot of agents. So when the agent is next negotiating their big commercial deal, how much value is put on the social media side? Well, the last time a deal was done two or three years ago, they're done in fairly long cycles. Let's say it's a two-year deal, a four-year deal. Facebook wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really around at scale then. Now it is. And it is becoming a very key part of the negotiations. So Adidas signs a new athlete. They will put into their contract a certain amount of posts or tweets that need to go out a week from the athletes. So it's becoming part of it, but not the central part of it. The reason it's not the central part at the moment is because it's very hard for anyone, any company like ourselves, to say what is that Facebook message worth. 
So as soon as anyone, and we're working on this pretty hard, to put a value on one post, so one post in Twitter gets sold for $10,000 on Kim, Kim Kardashian's page. We could have, um, we don't work with her yet, but uh, Maria Sharapova, we can look at, and it's not actually directly selling a post, but one post can be worth up to $100,000 by looking at how um, a brand would pay for TV advertising, reaching 20 million people and reaching 20 million on Maria's page. So as soon as we can say a Facebook post is worth $1,000, 1,000 pounds, whatever it is, then that game will very much change. It's being able to make it simple because these decisions, when the big decisions about budgets, say it's McDonald's, Coke, FIFA's having all these conversations, obviously they're all big sponsors. If they can't work out what it's worth, then they can't buy it. So it's that simple. So there are innovative brands that try and they'll try to pay five pounds for, uh, 5,000 pounds for a tweet or a post. They won't spend 50,000 because they didn't know how it did. They can't justify the spend at the moment. So that's the problem that needs to be solved. Um, but that is being solved. One of the ways Facebook over Twitter is solving this, if I, do, if I spend 10 hours on a, uh, an athlete's Twitter profile and I spend 10 hours on Facebook, I get far more back from Facebook. I, I, it's not even close how much I get back. So Facebook, and the reason for that is the Facebook give me the data. Facebook tell me so much data about what's going on with that page that I can then speak to a brand and say, hey, you know, 20 million fans, watch this, that has a value. Let's talk about that value. Um, Twitter's getting there though. What Twitter is fantastic for is the live, when live sport is happening. Uh, so that's, they are kind of very, very different. And the last bit, where there are commercial posts happening, so I don't know if any of you saw dispatches here in the UK where you had um, essentially lots of the Coronation Street staff, uh, the cast were being paid to tweet. So they get taken to like a room where there's all these product companies that give them the product and say, hey, why don't you send a tweet? And they wink at them and then they send a tweet. Well, that shouldn't be happening. That's, uh, that's essentially a paid for endorsement where um, the fans aren't stupid, basically. Now, with our relationship with Facebook, it's a pretty unique relationship. So Facebook have given us a concession to actually go out within, and we have to clear every advertiser with them, but we can get sell a Facebook post for an agreed amount of money to a brand and then distribute that on Facebook. Now, this happens all the time when you're not supposed to, but we have the stamp that you can do it. So they've changed, tweaked their policy to allow us to do this. Now this is becoming a bit of a land, you know, watershed moment because I can show to a brand that, uh, and it's a brand that might have sponsored this arena, not saying who it is, working with a Tom Daly. They might have spent 20,000 pounds on one message and they got 15 times better return on that message than spending on a digital video ad for the same. So it reached 15 times more the amount of people and 15 times more those people downloaded the music app. It was a highly successful campaign and it was easy and it was cool. But it did. So on all, 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 all of these messages that we're every single one, so we go against the grain on this. So the ASA advises that you could put the word spawn, um, which for me, have you misspelled spoon? I don't know, it's not as clear as it could be. If we do a tweet, it has to say sponsored on it. When we do a commercial Facebook message, we also did these for uh, Over the Ashes. We, worked, we actually worked with Sky Sports to help them tell the world that the Ashes was on Sky Sports. So we worked um, with them and it said, sponsored by Sky Sports at the bottom. We actually did A-B testing between um, one without sponsored and Facebook let us do this test and one with. And we had a 9% uh, increase on the one we sponsored. So all the people think it's, oh no, they're not gonna click on my ad. No, it's, that's rubbish. They actually don't treat the fans like idiots and they will actually respond more. And the key on these ads, they're not really ads, it's a new type of endorsement. It's to be authentic. So there's no call to action. There's no click off um, generally. It's just uh, unless it's, I'm actually using this product, so this is where you can, and they have to be using it. They can't just be faking it. Um, they'll take a pitch themselves. So normally a selfie. So in Tom's case, he landed at LAX. He was using a music app. He, was, he actually was listening to it. We had some fun putting the, uh, the tracks on. And then he took a picture and then he just said, hey, this is me, I've done it. it's really cool. Help me beat the jet lag. Um, that we think is the right way to do it, to be authentic, 
tell the fans what you're doing um, because yeah, they're really they're not stupid. They're they're smart and uh, yeah, and be honest about it, which is completely against the grain to everyone else, but we think it's right. Um, Facebook is also going so far with this that if you commit, if you're a brand, if you commit a serious amount of spend for, uh, with Facebook, they will give you what's called a free brand uplift survey. It's done by a company called Nielsen. So this is a survey that basically says it was a good use of good spend. Well done, Mr. Advertiser. So it, it would be a report that a TV buyer, bring it back to where most of the money is in TV still, they would be used to getting these, so more people use the product as a result of this uh, advert, or more people think highly of your brand and are more likely to buy or recommend it to your friends. So you get that as part of this package as well. So Facebook are, and Twitter are also doing something very similar to that as well. So this is where Facebook and Twitter are innovating, and they're smashing it when it comes to making money at the moment. They're really doing well. But it's to answer your, sorry, to answer your questions, yes, be honest. You should say it's sponsored, always. Don't sit there um, with a judge. I don't know if you heard my I talk before, but two years ago, I had a horrific court case that we lost very badly, should have lost, shouldn't have even gone to court. Um, so if a judge is there, and, and if, if one or two fans could think it's not a sponsored or not an advertised uh, commercial message, then that's it, you've lost. So if you put this is a sponsored message, you can't really go wrong there. You don't, and if it does better, uh, stick with it. Um, but then with the athletes are, are any of the athletes doing it for the money? No. We don't start out saying for the athletes, hey, we're going to make you loads of money. In fact, we say if we make some money, um, it's going to be on our sports website, and that covers our costs. You don't get any of that. We give them a very high-level service, and it's really about content. So it's about a media partnership with Wayne Rooney, where we write nice things about him, and he gives us more access to him, his life, his family. Uh, and then he also talks about us to Rio, to his other friends, and so on. And then we get more clients. But for us, it's about bringing, like I started off with, this fan closer to Rio or Rooney in, a, in an authentic way, not, not this is a tacky picture that a brand has, has done. I mean, some of the worst messages we've done on our Facebook pages are the ones we've been given by their brands. Absolute worst. I love sending the brand the report when it's just terrible. Um, so, <laughs> and then we'll advise and say, hey, why don't you do something cool, do it at the O2, let's get some other celebrities in, make it you know, relevant, and they work brilliantly. So um, it's changing. Any more? No, no, Done? Am I being <laughs> taken off? Yeah. yeah, Instagram, sorry, Instagram, that's also really good, but um, uh, Instagram I see in the same, so fashion, fashion's really big on Instagram, uh, really, really good, not so big, um, in other, uh, Instagram, great, but they're not giving you all the data. So if I want to turn it into a business, I need to basically say how well it's done. And if Instagram can't tell me how many people have seen my picture. But yes, we're doing that for us. Uh, so yeah, Rio Ferdinand, we did his Instagram page the other day. I helped with a few other kind of, um, IMG run a lot of talent like Justin Timberlake, Miranda Kerr. So we kind of help with those um, people where we can. But Instagram is definitely one in kind of the, the fashion side. I see it as being crucial. Yeah, it's here. Instagram's great. And it's, uh, it's, if you speak to a younger audience, it's, um, no, it's good. It's good questions. Um, they're good questions. It's definitely one to, to consider. Um, but each of them have, don't try and one tiny bit of advice that we found out the wrong way is if you have the same bit of content on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, the fans, they don't like that. They kind of tend to be a bit more Instagram people or Twitter people or Twitter trolls or Facebook, Facebookers. That's it. And I have had enough time of being dragged off. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Has a great speech. Thank you. Uh, if there's anything else you need, uh, just give me a ring. Uh, cool. uh, ladies and gentlemen, next up on the stage, we have Bledon Reese, who will be talking about connected health and ecosystems in about five minutes. Thank you.
Where if you push the bottom line. 